Good morning, KWC. It is great to see you. Those of you that are joining us here in the, fel- in the sanctuary, as well as those that are joining in the Fellowship Hall, and welcome to those joining online. I want to say a quick thank you to Sila helping put that video together. And on behalf of Sila, just say a, a huge thank you. Your generosity uh, made it possible for us to have a van load that we were able to deliver to two area pregnancy centers uh, just a couple weeks ago. And so thank you for your generosity. We look at continuing to partner with local pregnancy centers to make a difference because we do believe that every life matters. Amen? Because God created us. Amen. It is Sanctity of Life Sunday, and there is more information available. You see a little note there in the bulletin. Hopefully you grabbed one of those. Besides being Sanctity of Life Sunday, it is also Global Outreach Sunday, third Sunday of the month. And I just want to let you know that we have, we're going to start doing a missionary of the month, and we'll post something there in the lobby. But our our missionary for this month is Courtney Dunn. Courtney is new uh, as a partner of King's Wesleyan Church. We are starting our new year, uh, new pledges, new commitments. And uh, we are continuing with the same amount. Thank you for your generosity. We were able to meet our goal for 2020. Um, we're keeping the same ones that we've had uh, this last couple years, with the exception of the Hardys. They are no longer going to be serving with the Photozo people. And uh, so there was an opening, and Courtney reached out to me about the time that I found out that the Hardys were not going to be continuing on with the Photozo people. And uh, Courtney asked if we'd be interested in partnering with her one way or another. I'm like, I think we would. We have an opening, and the, the board voted to take Courtney on. If you uh, look at her last name and may be wondering, yes, Courtney is related to Dr. Jim Dunn, who has been with us a number of times over the last few years. She is his daughter. And so I'm very thankful for Dr. Dunn and uh, the blessing that he has been to me personally, been to Kingston Wesleyan Church. And I'm excited about the opportunity that we have now to partner with Courtney as she prepares to go to Eastern Europe to share the love of Christ there. If you want to partner with Courtney and the rest of those uh, that are part of the Global Outreach Team, uh, you can do so by writing a check or putting cash in an envelope. Just mark Global Outreach. You can drop that in the offering buckets or if you want to give online. Uh, there is a way to also just mark Global Outreach, and we'll make sure that that goes to that fund. Again, I want to go back to Sanctity of Life Sunday just very quickly. There is more information at RTL, which is righttolife.org. So RTL.org, encourage you to get more information about that. I also want to just say quickly, if you have had an abortion... I want you to hear today that God loves you. And I want you to hear today that God can still use your story for his glory. And so whether you're in person or online, please know that the church does not hate you. God does not hate you. He values life. And though we are against abortion, we are not against those who have had abortion. We love you, and we want God's best for you. And if you are carrying the pain of having an abortion or being part of somebody having an abortion, there is help available. RTL.org has some resources. And if you want just somebody to talk to, my wife and I are always available. We want to walk with you and help you to see the better days that God has for you, the restoration, reconciliation, and being able to move forward, and again, seeing your story be used for God's glory. And so just want to to share that uh, with you. You know, I think one of the things that is misunderstood when a church takes a position or an organization or whatever uh, takes a position against abortion that it it seems like for some, it automatically means that they are against women. And and the byproduct of that or the conclusion that some will often make is that the Bible, and more pointedly, that God is against women. 
and he, nothing could be further from the truth. He, the verse was shared in the video, and I just want to reiterate that in the beginning, God created man and woman, and he created humanity, man and woman, in his image. And that God has given a sacredness to humanity, both men and women. Yes, he created two genders, male and female. And yes, we see throughout scripture that oftentimes God will have a certain role for males, men, and different roles for women. Sometimes women do things in scripture that typically we see men doing. But make no mistake about it, they are equally valuable to the kingdom of God. And having a daughter, I'm especially thankful for the passages like we're going to look at today that show a godly woman being used by God. I hope you brought your Bibles with you or a, a smartphone or a tablet that you can access and be able to follow along. I'll have it up on the screen, most of it. But we're going to take a look at Judges chapter 4. We'll take a little bit of a peek into Judges chapter 5 as well today as we continue our series, Dark Horses. We're going to take a look at Deborah in particular. Beginning with Judges chapter 4 verse 1 again. And we saw this last week and there's this pattern as I mentioned last week. As we look at the book of Judges, which we did last week, we'll look at Judges today. And then we'll look at Judges one more time next week. As we continue on with our series, Dark Horses, and we see this pattern, this roller coaster of the nation of Israel, where they have these amazing highs, where they're walking with God, and God does amazing things in and through them. And then they go through these valleys where they turn their back on God, they start worshiping other idols, other gods, and not living for God, turning their back on God. And we see that that's what happens again, again. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, now that Ahud was dead. So, again, a reminder that God is an on-purpose God. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Sisera, the commander of his army, was based in Harasheth Hegoyom. Now, before I move on, I, I want us just to kind of take note as we walk through this passage of the different characters that are presented, okay? So, so first of all, I, I want us to look at, and we see the main character, even though Deborah is our dark horse, the main character is who? The Lord. What does these couple verses, what do they tell us about the Lord? What can we know about God? from these couple verses. Well, I would suggest to you that they are reminders that the Lord is holy, that he's righteous. I think it's reminders, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, that God is an on-purpose God. We also see a couple others that are mentioned here. We have Jabin, the king of Canaan. Not a lot is said here at this point, but we, we can see Jabin, and you might want to write in your notes, Jabin. We also see Sisera, and Sisera is the commander of his army. Now, Sisera is going to come into play a lot more than Jabin as we continue on. And we'll learn a little bit more about both of them here as we read verse 3. Because he had 900 chariots fitted with iron and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. So Jabin and Sisera, we see that they are cruel and that they oppressed God's people. We also see that Sisera, as commander of Jabin's army, had it pretty well made. And there's a reason scripture points out the 900 chariots fitted with iron. He had the best of the best that you could find for an army. Other armies are terrified because they've got 900 chariots, and they're not just chariots, they're chariots fitted 
with iron. We see something else here about the Lord. They cried out to the Lord for help. Why would they cry out to the Lord for help? Because they know that God is a caring, merciful, grace-giving God. Even though they had turned their back on him, they know they've heard the stories that God is a merciful God. That when you've hit rock bottom and you cry out to the Lord, God does respond. He does answer because he's a merciful God. And we'll see as we did last week, when somebody cries out to God, God responds, but God often delivers, God often works through humanity. He often chooses, not always, but most often will choose to work through his people. Here's Deborah. Verse 4, now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. And so here again, we have another character that's introduced into our passage today. And I, I think it's worth just kind of pausing and making sure we see a little bit more about who Deborah is. I've highlighted couple of different things that she positions, if you will, that she served in. Number one, she was a, a prophet. Well, what is a prophet? What, do the, what does a prophet do? Typically, a prophet does one of two things and sometimes both. They foretell and they forthtell. They tell about what's going to happen and or they basically give warnings or encouragement on behalf of God. Either way, they're speaking on behalf of God. They're a voice for the Lord. That's what a prophet does. We also see that she held court, which means she's serving as a judge. In some translations, actually will say she was leading Israel at that time. Whatever the case, we see that she was setting up and she had a place where people would come with disputes and she would discern for them. What does it take to be able to discern a case? Wisdom, understanding, knowledge. You typically need to be a good listener. And we see that Deborah has all of these qualities because people kept coming to her to have their disputes decided. She knew the difference between right and wrong. And she was a voice for the Lord, which we understand then that she was one that listened to the Lord. You see, the difference between a, a good prophet and a bad prophet, a good prophet listens to the Lord and then speaks for the Lord. A bad prophet just claims to speak for the Lord. And so it's not too long, typically, before you can decipher, determine if they're a good prophet or a bad prophet because they, either what they say comes true and there's validity to it, there's proof to it, and you can say, yes, this is somebody that speaks on behalf of God, or... Like, nope, that didn't happen like they said it was going to happen. That was empty words. That wasn't of the Lord. They're either a righteous prophet or they're a false prophet. Verse 6, she sent for Barak, or Barak, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. Again, we have another character that comes into our story for today, Barak. Now, what do we know about Barak? Barak is the commander of the Israel army. We don't know a whole lot more about him at this point. We'll learn a little bit more as the story unfolds. 
But we see that the Lord says and speaks through Deborah the prophet, and Deborah the prophet gives the message to Jabin, the commander of Israel's army, and she says that God says, God commands you, go. It's an imperative. God's not saying, hey, I've got an idea. What do you think about it? Let's talk it through. God just says, go. And then with that imperative, with that directive, is a promise. I will. And so Deborah gives Jabin this directive that has a promise from God. But, or to, to Barak. But how does Barak respond? Barak said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Certainly I will go with you, said Deborah. But because of the course... You are taking the honor will not be yours for the Lord will deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. Now, what do we know about Barak? He's a what? A sissy? Is that what I heard? Chicken? He's weak? And I'm thinking, is he weak mentally? Is he weak phys physically? What is going on? And then the men in the room, my guess is, most of you are sitting there going, dude, give me your man card. And the women in the room or watching online are what? Guys, take note. <laughs> like, yeah, you go, girl. Like, it's like, if you go, I'll go. Conditional, right? Like, but it wasn't a conditional statement. God just said, go. Why is, why is Barak saying, you know what, Deborah, if you'll go, I'll go. But if you're not going to go, I, I'm not going either. Think about it. I, I want you to, I'm not going to give you the answer yet. I think I know the answer, okay? I'm not going to give you the answer yet. I, I, I think you're going to sit there going, okay, Barak's weak. And I would agree he's weak, but I think he might be weak in a different area than what you're thinking he's weak. Uh, yes, Barack is lacking, but I think he's lacking in an area that's different than what you probably are thinking Barack is lacking. Well, what does this couple verses tell us about Deborah? I would suggest to you these couple verses tell us that Deborah is a woman of courage. I would also suggest to you that this passage tells us that Deborah is a person of great faith. Her courage comes from her faith. She trusts that God's going to do what God said he's going to do, and so she's like, okay, yep, I'll go with you. That wasn't her position. She's, she's a judge. She's a prophet. She's not the commander of the army. But she trusts that God is going to do what God said he's going to do. Barak needs a little bit of help, so she's going to go with Barak. Actually, I want to fill you in on a couple other verses. We're going to skip to verse 14. In verse 11, in verse, or, uh, verse 10, Barak gets his troops ready. In verse 11, Heber, the king, the Kenite uh, pitched his tent. It's just kind of like an obscure, like thrown in the middle here. Like, who is this guy? And what's this tent have anything to do with the story? And it's just kind of like scripture is putting it here, just a little plant, a little seed. We're going to come back to this guy later on. God's at work. And we're not going to give you the full picture, but understand that Barak is getting the army ready. Understand that, that uh, Heber the Kenite, Kenite had, had pitched his tent. And then verses 12 and 13 tell us that Sisera hears what Barak is, is up to. And so Sisera gets his army ready for battle. And so we've got Barak that has the Israelites ready to go into battle. We've got Sisera that's got his army ready to go into battle with the 900 chariots fitted with iron. And then we've got some dude that's got a tent. You with me so far? Verse 14. Then Deborah said to Barak, go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? 
So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword, and Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. Now, in case you're wondering and going, oh, Sisera got away, I'm not going to read and take us through the rest of chapter 4 at this point. I just want you to know that Sisera did not get away. You remember that tent that we talked about just a little bit ago? Well, you see, the guy that owned the tent, he wasn't in the tent, but his wife was there. And he and his people had made an alliance with King Jabin. And so Sisera's like, oh, I'm safe here. I'll go into this tent. And he goes into the tent, and wouldn't you know it, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, Jael, Gave him some milk. Do you know what milk has in it? Tryptophan. Do you know what tryptophan is? It's also in turkey. So you eat a big Thanksgiving meal, you eat a lot of turkey, and what do you do? You go take a nap, right? She opens this skim of milk. He drinks this nice warm milk lays down she puts a blanket over him and he goes Betty bye and he doesn't wake up because she strategically placed a tent peg in him and you can read the rest of the story if you want to get the rest of the details and a better understanding and then Barak comes and finds Sisera in the tent JL had taken care of him. And so we get this great lesson that we can learn. Never enter the tent of another man's wife. Great moral to the story. But I believe that there is something maybe even more important for us to learn from this story. Four things that I think we can take from this dark horse. The first thing that I want you to see is trusting God often begins with trusting someone who trusts in God. If we go back to Barak, I don't think it was so much that Barak was weak mentally or weak physically. I think Barak was weak in his faith. I think Barak trusted in Deborah more than Barak trusted in God. I think that Barak saw Deborah and saw how she lived her life and she was trustworthy. He didn't have a, a personal walk with God or at least it certainly wasn't at the level of her faith and wasn't at the point where he's like, okay, I'll go do whatever God says to do. But if you'll go with me, I trust you. And so if you really believe this and you're, you believe it enough to go with me, then I'm good because I trust you. And, and I think if, if you look at your own life and your own faith journey, I think most likely your faith journey started on the coattails of somebody else's faith. I'm guessing your faith journey is similar to Barak's. That you didn't initially start going, okay, well, God says do this, so I'm just going to do it. You started watching in observing somebody else in their faith walk, and you trusted them, and you were walking kind of with them, and you were following them as they followed Jesus, and then somewhere along the line, you stopped following them only and started following Jesus, trusting in Jesus. But trusting God often begins with trusting someone who trusts in God. So I think there's a question that is worth pondering this morning. Does my life instill trust? If our goal is to see people place their trust in Jesus for salvation, and understanding that most people's faith journey begins 
by them trusting in someone who trusts in God? Are we trustworthy so that they will put their trust in us so that we can help them then put their trust in God? Are we living in a way that they can believe what we say? Are we living in a way, and usually if they believe what we say, it's because we do what we say. Because we live according to Scripture, and we trust God, and they see something different. For instance, do you know that if you tie to the church, that just is crazy? I mean, to, to give 10% of your income, that that's like a car payment or whatever. I don't know how much you make, but quite possibly a car payment every month that you're going to give to the church. That's ridiculous. If you're looking through a non-faith, non-God lens, if God's not in the picture and you don't understand the biblical principle of tithing, and you don't understand God's faithfulness, giving to the church, especially at that kind of level, just seems ridiculous. But yet, those of you that have given to the church, and you have faithfully given, you have seen God's faithfulness. And I think it's possible that there can be those that aren't as far along in their walk and as they see and understand and how the principle of tithing works and that God is faithful to his word, that when we trust him with our finances, God continues to take care of us. That they too could say, oh, well maybe instead of just kind of giving God a tip every once in a while, maybe I too can and should start tithing. But does my life instill trust? Because if they can't trust you, how can we expect them to trust God? Now granted, make no mistake, they're still responsible for their own faith. Can't, can't just use us as a cop-out because we weren't trustworthy or, or whatever. But, again, if our goal is to see people place their faith, their trust in God, and understanding that oftentimes it begins by them trusting somebody who trusts in God, again, I think it's worth asking, does my life instill trust? Can they trust me? Let me go back to verse 14. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. We see something here. Huge, tr huge step that just took place in, in a matter of just a handful of verses. Barak went from riding on Deborah's, the, the coattails of Deborah's faith, to stepping out in his own faith. He went from, if you go, I will go. When, when God first said through Deborah, go, Barak responded with a if. This time, when Deborah says go, speaking for the Lord, how does Barak respond? He just goes. He's, he's taken the faith himself. He trusts God. There's another lesson here. Deborah is speaking it. Barak then goes and acts on it. It's this lesson here. You can trust God will do what he said he's done. Not just what he's going to do, but the way God operates, because God is not limited by time and space. When God says, this is done. It's in his mind, and in reality, it is done. How can he say that? Because he's God. I delivered them into your hands. That's past tense, right? Delivered. It's already happened. It's as good as done. 
But yet, for Barak, for Deborah, it was in the future. But they trusted that God will do what he said he's done. You know, it's, it's, it's sad, but it's reality. I like to be able to say, I will do this and I will do that. But I really try to not say that a whole lot. Because I'm not always able to come through on whatever I say I will do. Why is that? Because I'm human. And things happen. And there are a lot of things that are outside of my control. Sometimes it's my own fault. Sometimes it's memory. Sometimes it might be something else. Sometimes I just don't really have the ability to do what I thought I had the ability to do. But quite often it's just because there are things that I can't control. It's beyond me. I can give the effort. I can control the effort. I can control the desire. I can put that into it, but it doesn't guarantee the results because I'm not sovereign, but God is. And so when God says it's done, guess what? It's done. Even if you haven't walked into that reality, even if you haven't experienced that reality, as far as God's concerned, it's done. And Barak and Deborah, they learned that you can trust God will do what he said he's done. Second question that I want you to just ponder today, during our time together, but beyond our time together, and maybe even start writing down some notes. What has God promised? What has God promised? And you may want to make maybe two lists, like general promises, promises that we see in his word, promises that are for all people. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's, that's a general promise to God's people. But then there are other promises that sometimes God will give us as individuals. And I would encourage you to write those promises down as well and to keep note of those and to find strength and encouragement from those promises, whether they be general promises that are given throughout God's word to God's people or whether it's a specific promise that God has given you. Building off of that, I'm going to go back to verse 15. This really caught my attention as I was reading through the text over and over again, this one word, advance, at Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword, and Sisera got down from his chariot and fled on foot. At Barak's advance, just a great lesson here that we can learn from Barak. God goes before you, but he often won't move before you move. I'm, I want that to sink in. I'll walk you through it just a little bit. You see, God had gone before. Deborah was telling Barak that, that, that God had promised deliverance. And we even see kind of a foreshadowing of even how God was going to provide deliverance. That there was this guy that had a tent, this tent dweller, that was living right in the middle of where they were in a, going to end up doing battle. Is that coincidence, or is that God going before? We see that God went before. We see that God is preparing things. God is orchestrating things, but yet God's not making the final move. God's not going to actually see what we have heard promised until Barak advanced. Until Barak moved, then God routed Sisera's army. So I have another question. I know I've got a lot of questions today. And I'm still not done, but 
another question that I think we need to ponder today and through the week. What is God waiting for you to do? God's gone before. He's preparing the way. It's, it's there. But he's told you to do something. And you haven't done it yet. Maybe. Maybe it's something like asking for forgiveness. God's gone before. Christ has died on the cross and rose from the grave. And God's saying, it's, it's your move. Will you trust me? Will you confess your sin before me? Because I'm ready to move. I love 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will cleanse us and purify us from all unrighteousness. He's gone before. He's provided the way of salvation. He's provided the way to have our sins forgiven. But he's waiting for us to move, for, for him to really move, so that we can experience that freedom, that grace, that forgiveness. God goes before you, but he often won't move before you move. Great lesson that we can learn from Barak. It's interesting as we go through and we think oftentimes, if you've heard the story before, which probably some of you have heard the story, we look at Barak and we think oftentimes he's kind of cast as this wimp, dweeb. I don't know, you can fill in the, the blank with a, a variety of maybe uh, different things. Maybe a little more harsh or colorful. I don't know, but you can think of a lot of different things. But you know how Scripture actually records him? As a great man of faith. Because he understood that God goes before you, but he often won't move before you move. Why doesn't God move before we move? Because then it wouldn't be faith anymore. If God acted all the time before we did anything, before we responded to his voice, whatever that voice was calling us to do, maybe it's wait. But maybe it's to do something. If God always moved before we moved, there's no need for faith. Here's what Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says about faith. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Barak became a great man of faith. It's interesting to me, if you continue on in Hebrews chapter 11, what oftentimes is referred to as the hall of faith chapter, because the Hebrew writer, after he describes, defines what faith is, he then goes a bunch of examples and goes back to the Old Testament and starts listing the different heroes of the faith. And, and some of them, he, he recaps their story and how they demonstrated faith. And then he gets to a part towards the end of chapter 11 where he just says, you know what, and I don't have enough time. There's not enough space to go in and go through all the different stories of these other individuals and others. And you know whose name was listed? As he went on in chapter 11, one name from our passage today that was in there, and it wasn't Deborah, even though she definitely was a woman of great faith. You know whose name is listed in verse 32 of chapter 11? Barak. Barak had gone from somebody who lacked in faith to somebody who is noted for their faith. Which makes me wonder a little bit. You go, well, I wonder what Deborah would think about that. Would that make Deborah sad? Like she didn't get listed, didn't get any ink, didn't get any love in Hebrews chapter 11, but Barak did? Like, well, Barak wouldn't have been what Barak was unless 
He followed after my coattails, right? That's not her attitude at all. I'd encourage you, if you haven't read it already, read chapter 5. Chapter 5 is titled Deborah's Song. And in Deborah's Song, basically it's a recounting of what takes place in chapter 4. There's some other things that are thrown in there, but it says actually that Deborah and Barak sung it as a duet. But as you look at it, there's a couple things that stand out that stood out to me anyway as I read through chapter 5 a number of times. Well, one of the things was that Deborah celebrated the faith of others. Deborah celebrated the faith of others. She, she, she just pointed and like looked at them because she knew this. To be full of faith is great, but greater is the one who is faithful. And so whether it was her or it was Barak or it was J.L., who she calls in chapter 5 the most blessed woman, like she's lifting J.L. above herself because she understands to be full of faith is great. But the second thing as you read Judges chapter 5 is that you see what Deborah saw, what Deborah understood, but greater is the one who is faithful. I want to just read a little bit of chapter 5 and give you one final question. Words from her song says this, Hear this, you kings. Listen, you rulers. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will praise the Lord, the God of Israel, in song. Because at the end of the day, Deborah knew that J Judges chapter 4 wasn't really about Deborah. And it wasn't really about Barak. And it wasn't really about Jael. Judges chapter 4 is about the Lord. Judges chapter 4 is a reminder that God is worthy of praise. And so the last question that I want to leave with you as the praise team comes to lead us one more time is how has God proven to be faithful this week in your life? What are you praising God for? How has God proven to be faithful? Because to be full of faith is great. But greater is the one who is faithful. He's a good God, amen? He is faithful. And may we be faith-filled as we trust in him, as we worship him this morning. I'm going to invite you to stand if you're able. Heavenly Father, as we stand or maybe even as we sit, whatever the case would be, whether we're in person or online, May our hearts marinate in the truth of your word. Holy Spirit, may you draw out what we need to take from today. Maybe there's just one of those four questions that we really need to, as you work through us and as you speak to us, that we really need to ask, not just and try to answer ourselves, but asking you to help us to answer it so that we can be men and women of great faith. But Lord, in the end, May it all just point to the one who is faithful. And may we rejoice and celebrate in who you are and what you've done and what you're going to do. By faith, we pray this in and for your name. Amen.